All right. Wow. It's uh, thanks <laughs> for that. I'm I'm actually a little intimidated. I mean, because you all are like the mushroom experts, and I'm just a guy that finds things on the ground and eats them. So uh, I was really pleased though when you reached out to me because mushrooms are something I really love, and I've devoted a fair amount of energy to trying to learn and understand and access their power and all that sort of thing. So hopefully I'll I'll be able to introduce you to some new information tonight. Uh, if not, I apologize. I'll buy you a beer or something like that the next time we meet. So I guess without further ado, we can just start this. And uh, ha, okay. So hopefully there is Fungi Truths, Food and Medicine presented by blah, 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 blah. Um, how I want to start this out is just actually a I want the computer to work. Ah, there we go. So who am I? For those of you who don't know me, uh, usually everyone knows me or those that know me, know me as Meriwether. That was a nickname given to me many, many, uh, we're going on decades now. If you remember the Lewis and Clark expedition, Meriwether Lewis, his job was to record the interesting plants that might be of value to the, uh, the new country and this, you know, what we were trying to do. Uh, my personal side of things, I am the creator of the Foraging Texas website, www.foragingtexas.com. Uh, currently over 225 or more edible, medicinal, uh, drinkable, eatable plants and mushrooms that are found all over Texas. And one of the really cool things about Texas is we have 14 ecological zones. So pretty much any plant in North America can be found somewhere in Texas if you look hard enough. My day job, I am the medicine man for Medicine Man Plant Co. So ancient plants scientifically supported for modern issues. My background that led me into that is I was always planning on being a pharmaceutical scientist and I got a master's in medicinal chemistry and a PhD in physical organic chemistry. So physical organic chemistry, we don't make the molecules. We take the molecules man or God has created and apply them to a need of humanity. But like I said, my plan was to go off into the normal pharmaceutical world, but I was blessed with a number of research advisors that were really focused on natural products. And while I already was big into eating plants and the plants I found in the wild, they really showed me that there is medicinal properties to them too. Another thing, if you want to learn more, uh, there is the Outdoor Adventure Guides Foraging book by me, available on Amazon or through my Medicine Man website, www.medicinemanplantco.com. And that has 70 plants, uh, well, 70 plants and mushrooms. I believe there's five mushrooms in it but they are the beginner mushrooms, easy to identify, easy to use, actually tasty. Uh, so check it out. I will say if you buy the book from Amazon, from if you go through like my website, I get 79 cents. So really excited there about that. All right, the science behind things is really important to me. So especially with the Medicine Man Plant Co., uh, if I am saying this product will do this, I need science to, to believe that. I mean, the tradition is great. 40,000, 60,000, 100,000 years of tradition, awesome. I will treat myself with those things, but if I'm recommending it to someone else, I need to look at the medicine. So the most common place I go to find out this information is the National Library of Medicine. They have an electronic database, pubmed.gov. It's probably the best named website created by the American government, but pubmed.gov. Because when you go there, you are going to find yourself swept into a timeless period as you search paper after paper after paper. This is an electronic database of all the scientific research, at least the medicinal research, or, uh, well, really anything scientific, honestly, when it comes down to uh, the database. So you can just, in the search bar, put in the name of the plant and simply the word medicinal, and it will bring up all the studies that were done on it. And so I will be referring back to this, uh, this website quite often. So pubmed.gov. 
it's a, a great place to start seeing what research has actually been done on mushrooms, on plants, on the medications you might find yourself taking, all this sort of stuff. So really good. If the research was funded by U.S. government funds, then usually the entire paper is available. If not, there will be at least an abstract. Occasionally, there's just a title. If it's just a title, uh, I really don't recommend by going just by the title of the paper. PubMed.gov, excellent resource for really understanding the science of what's going on. Today's presentation, I'll be covering nine or 12 mushrooms. I forgot, I was kind of got lost in my own mushroom world there. But the purpose of this is to introduce you to some slightly lesser known wild mushrooms and their nutritional value and what medicinal research has been found using them but it isn't designed to be a full on everything you need to know about identifying the mushroom so you can go after this class with a flashlight into the woods to start looking for things so use what i'm telling you today to be just as an introduction to alert you to things you might want to look deeper into but when it comes to identifying wild mushrooms the rule of thumb i teach over and over and over and sometimes people even listen to it, is you want to look at eight to 10 stru structural features on the mushroom you're looking at, comparing it to whatever guide you are using to identify the mushroom. So eight to 10 structural features. So I have a list here of things like, what is it growing on? That is considered a structural feature. Now, is it growing out of the grass? Is it growing on dead wood? Is it growing out of cow poop? because mushrooms are very specific to the types of things they eat. Looking at the cap, we want to know the color, the size, any secondary structures, the shape, the gills, are they true gills? Are they false gills? Are they polypores? The spores, what color are the spores? What shape are the spores? The stem or the stipe, how thick is that? Are there any secondary structures on that, like scales or webbing or colors or color changes? shroud or veil is there remnants of it around is it still visible did it have one looking at the base are there a bunch of mushrooms connected together or just one individual mushroom growing out from the substrate uh, does it bulb at the bottom is there an egg the vulva there so you know the the base of the thing and then even the scent traditionally also the flavor of the mushroom was considered to be a structural feature but I choose not to use that because people don't always understand the idea of putting a little bit and then spitting it out right away. Um, sometimes they want to swish it around in their mouth like wine or something. It's like, no, 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 no. So let's just skip the whole taste thing, shall we? But again, the key thing when you're trying to identify a new mushroom is match up eight to ten of its structural features with whatever resource guide you're using for identification people will ask about apps so the mushroom apps where you take a picture of the mushroom or maybe several pictures of the mushroom uh, do they work and i admit i will i've started using those not as a confirmation tool but as a suggestion tool so take what the app says and then delve into other resources. Just don't take the app's answer as the God-given truth. Look at it, go, okay, it says it says, then either you know go to like mushroomexpert.com or some of the other websites, foragingtexas.com, and compare what is said on those or books like 100 Edible Mushrooms by Michael Coe or the Meltzer and Meltzer's Texas Mushrooms or some of the others like that. Other thing about mushroom identification is you are not going to find one mushroom book that has every mushroom in it. The number of mushrooms out there is absolutely tremendous. And any book that would cover all of them would be like three times the size of the Bible. So you may find a lot of mushrooms that aren't in your particular book which is why you generally need to have multiple 
different mushroom guides because they will have different mushroom uh different mushrooms in them all right so we're going to talk through a series of different mushrooms so we're going to start with puffballs i like them because they are usually the easiest to identify and very you know, pretty much any time of year there's some sort of puffball floating around and they're really easy to cook and they have just a nice mild mushroom mushroomy flavor so i figured yeah, that's a good starting point so mushrooms puffballs so looking at puffball nutrition uh, i will actually be covering three different puffballs but going through there wasn't a lot of nutritional information on them so what i could find was basically this so for each of the mushroom nutritional value servings i bring up it will be based on a 72 gram serving which is considered a one standard serving of mushrooms why it is one standard serving of mushrooms i can't tell you i don't know but that is what uh, over and over the papers uh described or some you know unit factor of 72 grams so like 144 grams which is two servings so if you're eating 72 grams of puffballs as you can see you're getting 18 calories most of those are in carbs but you also have quite a bit of protein and fats it's not bad not bad at all no vitamins and just trace amounts of a few minerals you know the manganese phosphorus and selenium and luckily we only need trace amounts of the manganese and selenium a little more phosphorus for our bones but the uh, what this tells us is the puffballs you know they're they got nutrition and they're not going to make you fat eating them or you know cause any issues like that so something to consider so of the different puffballs i want to start it with wolf's fart because that one just amuses the heck out of me so like a paradigm pyroforme and if i mispronounce the latin uh i apologize i figure i will get close and as long as i don't accidentally summon a demon that's good enough but the wolf's fart you find growing on dead wood they grow in clusters and they're about one inch to one and a quarter inches in diameter when you cut them in half that is the key to identifying them as when you cut a puffball in half any of the edible puffballs it will be a homogeneous white on the interior like you just got a marshmallow in half these are cool weather mushrooms uh generally fall winter spring if we have a particularly rainy summer we might find some then but looking at some of the science behind them, and I just wanted to point out the lower picture here, maybe you can see the pointer, cutting them in half when they're small and pure white through the center, that's what you're looking for. If you're starting to see a yellow or green or darker color uh, show up inside the puffball, that means that puffball is starting to convert to spores. Because the way the puffballs reproduce, instead of having gills that drop the spores, they are almost like an egg and then all the spores form it inside and then at some point they break open and puffs of of spores come streaming out so these are found all over the world and the best scientific paper i found was actually from uh researchers in tunisia and if you know anything about tunisia i'm gonna i'm gonna fly my nerd flag here that was where a lot of the tatooine from star wars was filmed but anyway, there are mushrooms out there. It's not all desert. And looking at it, what they found was the biggest component uh, medicinally of the wolf's fart was it was absolutely loaded with antioxidants. So if you are wondering, you know, why everyone is saying you got to have your antioxidants, you got to have your antioxidants, here's why. So at the end of your DNA strands, you have things called junk DNA. They are like the bumpers of the good DNA. They kind of protect the DNA from damage from other chemical reactions and free radicals and things like that. And so 
over time, these telomeres get shorter and shorter because they're getting broken by the free radicals and other things that are trying to attack the DNA. And there's a direct correlation between the physical characteristics of aging and the length of these telomeres. As they get shorter and shorter, the body starts to display in aging. And so one of the things the antioxidants do is they protect these telomeres from getting broken. And so long story short, you get enough antioxidants. Well, I can't say that you'll be immortal, but you'll be in better shape than if you're not getting them. So wolf's fart, terrible name, wonderful property. So another thing they found, which I thought was interesting, is there are enzymes in it that are really good at reduction of aldehydes. Aldehydes are a chemical structure. Uh, I won't bore you with a big blackboard of chemistry. But what was interesting about they are a waste product and they impact uh, an odor into a lot of soy products, especially the fermented soy products. But there are compounds in the wolf's fart that destroy these stinky aldehydes so that the soy product is no longer has that offensive smell, which makes it more uh, acceptable to the customer. So when I'm talking tonight, I'm not just talking about the medicinal properties, but also other interesting things that these mushrooms have been found to do that can help things. And getting rid of stinky soy odors is, is a useful thing. The last thing there, the spores of the puffball fungus lycoparaba is a reference standard for stable monodisperse aerosol for calibration of optical equipments. So the spores are all the same size, you know, give or take, you know, microns, tiny, tiny, tiny amounts. And they puff and disperse really well. So they were found that they make a really good standard for calibrating uh, optical equipment whose purpose is to measure particle size. Uh, for instance, cement. The speed at which cement cures and its strength is uh, related to the particle size. And so when they have different grades of cement, they have to separate out different particle sizes of cement and have all these particles together, all these particles, all these particles together. And then depending on the purpose of the cement, they will pick, you know, one of those. So to make sure that's going, you know, the cement is being, you know, sent to the right sack, if you will, they need optical equipment because you can't look at each grain. This equipment has to be calibrated. They found that the mushroom spores of the wolf fart is an excellent standard for calibrating the equipment. As a chemist, th this this geeks me out. So if, if you found that kind of boring, I apologize, but uh, welcome to my show. <laughs> All right. So another favorite puff. Oh, actually, uh, are there any questions at this point? What I'd like to do if, after each mushroom is just stop for a second. And let me just bring up the chat here. Okay. So Angel, if I could ask you uh to keep an eye on the chat and after each mushroom if an interesting question comes up i will pause and you hit me with the question sure thing perfect all right i love you guys you got your act together all right moving on oh okay so it didn't seem like there are any questions on on the, the Drea the... did pop one in there oh. Real okay. quick, made a wolf fart in the in the chat box. Um, so uh, she asked, "What kind of wood?" Uh, a great question. So here in Texas, I found it both on hardwoods and on pines. So a lot of times, the mushrooms will be a little more specific, like only preferring hardwoods or only preferring pines. But the uh, wolf's fart seems to be equal opportunity. It will grow on any of the larger woods um, i'm trying to think if there's it does prefer you know the shady yes. moist woods because mm -hmm. like most mushrooms the spores do need moisture around otherwise they desiccate and die so look for them in shady you know the deep in the woods lower areas where the ground may remain wet longer 
so that the wood in contact with the ground has more water to absorb up into it to keep the mushrooms going. But both on hardwood and on, and on the pine has been my experience. Any others? Um, where would you find them? That kind of goes into the same. same. Yeah. So again, just the deep woods, lower elevations, lower dips in the, in the terrain where it'll be somewhat moister. So wood fallen there itself also remains more moist, but they are generally a shade loving plant. You won't, or mushroom, sorry. You won't find them out in a sunny field on a, on a dead tree that fell out in the middle of the field. They, they really do prefer the shady areas. That being said, mushrooms can't read books. So every so often uh, one just decides, you know what, I'm gonna grow here. I haven't seen that there, but that doesn't mean, you know, there's not a one in a million chance that you do find some wolf's fart out on a fallen oak tree out in the middle of some farmer's field. Generally though, it's gonna be in the shady moist wood area. Okay, my personal favorite, the skull puffballs. I, I'm just amused by the shape. You know, the Calveta craniformis, it looks like a skull. Uh, probably my favorite of the puffballs, partially because it's all over our neighborhood here in spring. Uh, pretty much after any good rain in the spring or fall, it pops up and my neighbors know, hey, Mark, come get your skulls. And it's like, be right over. And uh, free food. Yeah. This is a grass growing mushroom. So unlike the wolf's fart, which only grows on dead wood, this does not grow on dead wood. It comes up out of the grass, out of the yards, out of the fields. So it is basically breaking down the grasses and other plants of that nature there in the yards, in the fields. They can get big. They can get you know nine inches in diameter. So pretty easy and you know, about the size of a softball. And I said that that very distinctive skull shape where they have the bulb and then the neck. Like all the other puffballs, you cut it in half, you have a homogeneous white interior, you're good to go. So this is what the interior looks like. The surface can turn somewhat brown and mottled depending on the age. Uh, it can start out kind of white, but as they age, it can get brown and mottled. But even at that point, if you cut them open, if they look pure white all the way through, uh, no sign of yellow or green in the center spreading out, uh, they're good to eat. I normally peel the skin off. It's more of a texture thing, um, especially on the skulls because there's so much there. It's I eat the crust of my bread, but I don't eat the crust of my mushrooms, so sue me. But uh, looking at the science, there was some interesting things there. One, it is an immunomodulator. So one of the things when the COVID first hit, people were really concerned about what was called a cytokine storm, where your immune system just freaks out and releases a whole bunch of white blood cells that just go around and start attacking everything. And so they were warning you, don't take elderberry because it stimulates the immune system and it will lead to a cytokine storm. Turns out it wasn't the case. The COVID, there might've been an occasional case of that, but for the most part, the cytokine, cytokine storm was not an issue. But going back to uh, the Spanish flu in 1919, I believe it was, that was a case where the uh, flu actually triggered this overwhelming reaction from the immune system. And the younger and healthier you were, the bigger the immune system cytokine storm was, and it attacked the liver and the kidneys and the heart, and you would die really fast. So the cytokine storm, it is something the infectious disease experts worry about. And they found that the skull the skull puffball has some compounds in there that help prevent it. Apoptosis uh, induction and anti-tumor activities. Basically, it interferes with the, uh, well, cancer cells. They're, the reason they are cancer cells is their programmed death switch has been shut off. And so instead of dying at a certain point, the cells just keep 
reproducing and producing more and more and more and more cells. So there's something in the skull puffball that has found that it triggers the death switch in cancer cells. Doesn't seem to do it in healthy cells because you would die <laughs> if you ate a skull puffball. I can vouch I've been eating skull puffballs for a long, long time and I'm still here. So those are some really good things here for the skull puffball. The other thing I found really interesting, another scientific paper I found was that the compounds from the skull puffball work as a uh, pre-emergent herbicide. They prevent the germination of plants. And this explains something that I had noticed when I was out and about collecting the skull puffballs is usually there was just like a, a patch of soil around them. So there's something in the skull puffball that does have some natural herbicide uh, limited properties. And in a way that makes sense, because if you think about what it eats, it eats dead stuff. So creating dead plants kind of feeds it. So it'd be really interesting to see uh, what sort of herbicide, you know, a natural herbicide comes out of that, if any. All right. Any questions about the skull puffballs? Uh, I have one. Are they um, are they used? Are any of the compounds in them currently used in any kind of pharmaceutical or anti-cancer medications? No. And uh, let me explain why. We'll go sideways for a second, but it's worth like a minute. So the basic thought process is if you want to medicate the masses, you need mass produced medication. And so what scientists do when they are trying to come up with new medicine is they will look at these compounds, try and identify what is in the plant or mushroom doing the job. And then they will come up with a way of synthesizing it from scratch from the ground up rather than extracting it from mushrooms. That is always going to be cheaper. Uh, with plants and mushrooms, you have to grow them, you have to dry them, you have to extract them. There's all these steps. It's kind of risky if you get bad weather or something like that. Um, so it's easier to use the compounds as the proof of concept, like, wow, there's something in here that does that. Oh, it's this molecule. Okay, how do we make this molecule without involving the mushroom? So they guide the creation of molecules, but then once we know what's in it, uh, the plant just kind of gets shuffled aside and says, aha, now we can do something. Uh, Yvonne. My question would be, are these, a, I haven't seen them in Texas and I'm in Austin, Texas, um, um, South Texas. Okay. I have found them in the Bastrop area. I have found them around Dallas. I find them all over the Houston area. Um, the soils, that suggests to me that they probably need a more acidic soil than the alkali soil around the, the Austin area. So, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I tend to find them um, in more dry areas, like like you're saying, like open fields. Yes, probably even more. sandy areas sandy, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I know there was um, one of the um, mycologists that were um, at UT when he retired, he moved to El Paso and studied desert puffballs. So there's a lot of old kind of um, observations and things and like mycoportal of desert puffballs and things like that. Uh, but it just became like a, a retiree hobby for him. Um, but yeah. Yeah, people don't think there's a lot of mushrooms in the desert, but when the rain appears, magic occurs in the desert. So. Mm -hmm. All right. So skull puff balls, tasty, eat it. All right. The giant puff balls. And I had to put this in here because they are just so amazing. You know, okay. Uh, Galvatia gigantia. We're going to go with that. See, that's the problem. When all you ever do is read the words and never hear anyone else ever pronounce them, you kind of have to guess at the pronunciation. So this is another one that is found growing out of the ground, both in the yards, fields. It will also grow in leaf litter. I have found it in the woods, uh, way up in the, in the northern Texas area, kind of right around the Red River area. These things can get huge, 14 or more inches in diameter. 
uh, sometimes being round, but like this one was just kind of weird and, you know, misshapen looking. Uh, I don't know why some end up round and some end up misshapen. I just got to figure some external force was applied to it by, you know, slugs or something trying to eat it and led to the misshapenness. But homogeneous white interior, like all the others. And this is, again, the kind of the cooler, wetter times, the fall and the spring. Or really, it'd be almost more like the beginning and ends of winter. Like I said, as before, you cut it in half, it should look like a marshmallow. And then I, I just included a picture of one that has gone to spore. Because one of the nice things about these, if you encounter a field that even if you find the the brown dried ones, that means you want to keep going back to that field because the my uh, you know the uh, mycelium are there when the weather uh, weather is right, these things are going to puff up. Okay, so some of the science found behind it: uh, inhibit uh, inhibiting lung cancer. So the A549 human lung cancer cells. Now this testing, uh, at least at this stage, has still been in a test tube, not in actual people with lung cancer. But going back to what I said, where they're trying to figure out just what exactly is in this extract that attacks the lung cancer or causes the lung cancer to shut off or whatever mechanism it works by, the uh, scientists will then try and recreate that and figure out a way of either coupling it with other molecules that will help it get to the lungs and get to the, the lung cancer, but at least it's a shot at a new way of taking care of lung cancer. There's some other compounds in the giant puffball that have been shown to be anti-diabetic agents, so type 2 diabetes helping with the insulin resistance or some other blood sugar issue. And if you look at the numbers of, you know, just U.S. citizens, North American citizens, and world citizens, how many are coming down with diabetes, it's insane. Um, it's become a huge health issue. Uh, I like to blame processed foods rather than people going out, walking around and eating things they find on the ground but there's probably not enough food out there for everyone to walk around and eat things they find on the ground. But anti-diabetic agents are another huge pharmacological uh, well that is trying to be tapped. Okay, production and characterization of amylase from Calvita gigantea. So amylases are the enzymes that break starches into sugars. Starches are just chains of sugar together. And so if you can break the starch into sugars, you can make it more digestible. But more importantly, mushroom beer. Mm -hmm. So the amylase, you know, when you like the malt that is used in beer mixed with the grains, its purpose is to start breaking the starches and the grains down so that the yeast can then eat the sugar that is produced by that and produce the uh, the alcohol. But there's some really good research showing that there's a, a very potent amylase in giant puffballs. So that's on my list of things to true uh, to try. Uh, I have a, a thing going on with Beerberg Brewery to come up with different wild beers. And this is on the list of things I really want to try uh, using giant puffballs as the malt instead of malt. Oops. Okay, any questions about the giant puffball? If not, we will move on to the jelly mushrooms. Now, the what jelly was, mushroom. Whoop. Excuse me, what was the taste on the giant puffballs? Do you enjoy? Yeah, so it just has your basic mushroom flavor. Um, oh, but one thing, it tastes great. You know, like, like uh, the white button, you know mushrooms it does produce an odd smell when you're cooking it i know my my dad hates the smell of the the while it's cooking but he loves eating it once it's cooked and just as a funky recipe because these are so big 
one of the things that people have started doing is slice the discs into thin, well, thin discs, kind of par baking it a little, and then covering it with pizza toppings and using then the giant puffball as the pizza crust. Always a fun thing to do. Okay. Jelly mushrooms, another weird and wacky mushroom. I like the jelly mushrooms. So again, going to the 72 gram serving size, there's actually a fair amount of calories in them, including sugar. So hmm, if you are trying to avoid sugars, maybe the jelly mushrooms and the hot and sour soup isn't the best thing to have. Uh, it is low in the monounsaturated fats. It does have some protein. As far as vitamins, it only has 0.4 of the daily recommended or daily value of vitamin C and not much calcium or iron either, but it has some. So as far as nutritional powerhouses, the jelly mushrooms in general are not those. The one people are most common with is the woods ear. So Ericularia Americana. <laughs> Sam the fungi guy, I hope you're not, well, you know, go ahead and laugh. That's okay. I, I, I don't mind, but I'm doing my best here. So yeah, the woods here, uh, dead wood, a preference for elder. So the elderberry, if you find a stand of elderberry, uh, especially one out in the wild where there's both live and dead wood, definitely take a look around there to see if there's any of the woods ear growing on it and then also i found these growing mainly on hardwoods but in particular willow and some of the other trees that grow close to water so the woods ear it really it prefers moisture Something to keep in mind there. So but I mean, most mushrooms do, but this one seems to be even more so. And it can actually handle some sunlight. If there's, if the, if the rotted wood has like an end in the water itself. So these really are, ear well, as I point to my headphones, but they're, you know, one to four inches in diameter. The inner surface, like, you know, the inner surface of the ear is going to be smooth and brown and a little on the slick side not really slimy but definitely smooth whereas the outer surface is going to be gray and fuzzy so you can see here like the the mushrooms that are built up again i hope you can see my pointer if not then uh i apologize but the inner surface is going to be brown and smooth and the outer surface is going to be gray and fuzzy so looking into it going over to pubmed.gov uh using the european version the ericula judia or the traditional woods ear the one that's found in asia and europe there are 139 medicinal papers looking at medicinal properties of the uh not the american one but the european and asian one but a lot of times with mushrooms these can be a guide to what the North American mushrooms may have. So things they found, anti-cancer, liver protector, antioxidant, back to that immunomodulator, wound healer, blood sugar control, lots of good things here. So yeah, there might be some sugar in your hot and sour soup, but go ahead and eat it because you're getting all these other benefits. One of the great, th blah, blah, blah. great things about the woods ear is they will dehydrate on the branch if it gets dry but even at this stage as long as the top is still kind of gray and fuzzy even if the mushroom is hard and dried you can still pick it and when you drop it in hot water or hot soup broth it will rehydrate just like a, a regular woods ear back to the the jelly like state in fact if you go to the asian markets around they will sell black mushrooms occasionally they'll call them woods ear but usually they will call them black mushrooms. And that is just the dehydrated versions of the Uricularia, the, the woods here. So just because it looks dead and dried on the branch does not mean you can't still use it. 
other jellies, not so much, but with the woods ear, I've definitely had a lot of good uh, results with that. All right, any question on the woods ear? Uh, so Sam asked, does it heal wounds via topical application or ingestion? Oh, great. Okay, yeah, Sam. Uh, so the research papers on that, they were a topical application. Uh, part of it was due to the demulcent effect of the mushroom. So it kind of helps seal the wound and helps the membranes reattach apparently. So yeah, it was more applied topically, pulping the mushroom into, you know, jellifying the jelly mushroom, if you will, put it in a blender, make it a paste and apply that to the wound. Any other questions? Good question. Yeah, that was good to get some clarity on that. So Drea asked, how else do you like to cook it besides hot and sour soup? Uh, just about any soup, stew or curry. Uh, Sunday night is usually curry night at our house. So if I find some during my weekend foraging, it's like, aha, this is going in the curry. And I dropped a link in the chat um, for our fluorescent forest this past Halloween. I made candied wood ears, which oh. is like a pretty simple, you know, it takes a couple days say pretty simple <laughs> but yeah you're not doing much besides allowing the mushroom to soak up flavor and then dipping them in chocolate yeah and i think sam you've had those before they're good right <laughs> that does sound sugar, good sugar makes everything good though <laughs> i'm picturing like a peppermint woods ear candies or something Ooh, yeah yeah mm. of course now i'm picturing a whorehound peppermint well anyway okay back to you guys <laughs> <laughs> All right, there is a mimic to the woods here, uh, but it's edible. It's a jelly mushroom again, the Exadia rakisa. And at any time, Sam or anyone else wants to jump in and, and pronounce it right, please feel free. Uh, I will not take it personally. This is another one that is found on dead wood. Instead of individual ears, it forms more of a clumpy, multi sort of, if you remember the movie, uh, The Thing, John Carpenter's The Thing at the kind of the base shape of the creature was more or less like the woods ear mimic. Unlike the woods ear that had the brown inner surface and the gray outer surface, this is just smooth brown all the way around all sides. Think of it like a Mobius woods ear. As long as it's somewhat cool and damp, there's a good chance you're gonna find it around and usually in the same areas that the true woods ear is growing. So looking into it, I could not find any scientifically researched papers. So at this point, there doesn't seem to be anyone looking into this particular one, the one we have here in Texas, but research has been done on other Exodia uh, species members and they have been found to reduce the blood pressure and cholesterol levels. So at this point, I think it's probably a better than 50% bet that the, the one we have around here, the Exodia rickesia, does have similar powers. Um, not 100%, but I'd say a good 51.8% that it will help with blood pressure. Then as far as using it, direct replacement of the woods here scrape it off rinse it off a little bit throw it in the soup throw it in the curry uh, i will tell you you can surprise people by making a green bean casserole uh, making the mushroom cream soup from scratch and having a mixture of wild mushrooms in there like the different puff balls and the woods ear and the woods ear mimic kind of fun it's not that hard to look up you know just a cream basic cream soup recipe and start throwing your wild collected mushrooms in there and life becomes that much yummier, life becomes that much better. So direct replacement in the any woods ear recipe. But then one of the things I try and get people to do is use some creativity. Like I would never have thought the candy, that's awesome. But it makes sense because these mushrooms, the jelly mushrooms, they really don't have any flavor themselves, but they're really good at absorbing the flavors, uh, other flavors in the foods. So using it as a flavor carrier is 
Awesome. Any questions on this one? All right. Witch's butter. This is like the white to somewhat translucent version of the Woods Ear Mimic, but it is a completely different genus. So Tremella fusiformis. And this is another one. It grows on dead wood, shady, damp areas, fall, winter, spring. So the cool, wet times of year. Uh, here in Houston, it rained really heavily since last night to uh, just uh, almost this morning. And so I know the woods right here are going to be filled with all sorts of cool mushrooms because this is ideal jelly mushroom season right now. So daytime temperatures in the 50s, maybe the 60s, nights down in the 40s. This is when you head out into the woods. So the witch's butter, this one has a lot of scientific research. This one is found both in Asia and in North America. And in Asia, it has a long and ancient history of being used medicinally and also as food. On the food side, again, mainly as a carrier of flavors and adding texture to the foods. But on the scientific side, so I found 107 research papers that talk about the Tremula fusiformis. So some of the things that it helps with is blood sugar control and also gastrointestinal tract repair. This says something to me. As a medicinal chemist, uh, this helps clue me in to what might actually be in there. Now, what I'm about to say is a swag, S-W-A-G, or scientific wild ass guess. But based on my experience, when I see something that has blood sugar control and also helps seal the gastrointestinal tract, that means there's some sort of slime component in it, a mucilage type thing. I didn't find proof of that, but just from its properties, its textures and how it's used, uh, I suspect there's something in there because that slime helps rebuild the mucosal membrane of the gastrointestinal tract. So that's where it comes into play there by sealing the damaged parts of the slime membrane of the gastrointestinal tract, it allows then the body to heal the under part of the GI tract, but also blood sugar control. So the slime found in plants and mushrooms, the mucilage, is particularly good at binding to sugar and only slowly letting it go which means if you're eating foods high in calories or starch, because your stomach is going to break the starch into sugars, then some compound in the witch's butter, something that makes gives it that slimy, gooey, jelly texture is probably binding to that sugar and not letting it cause a big spike. It's just slowly letting it go. So you get it instead of a big spike and then drop, it's just kind of a, a slow release. Again, that is a swag, a scientific wild ass guess. But based, again, on years of experience, it makes sense to me. Okay, cognition improvement and neuroprotective. Normally, when you think of these, you're thinking lion's mane or the other heresium. But this, the witch's butter, also seems to have some uh, beta-glucans that are really good for working on the neurons in the brain, protecting them, cleaning them, uh, increasing the number of them. Fat substitute in foods. This goes back to the texture. So a lot of times fat in foods is to give a creaminess in the mouth. And when you blend the witch's butter into you know, a butter, you know, to chop it up, puree it, it makes a good substitute for that oral sensation that normally you would get from fat. So use it as a fat substitute. It doesn't have the same flavor as fat. It really has no flavor but it at least gives the mouth feel. Um, in particular, it's used in vitamin enriched noodles. That was something that I just found. I wasn't, they didn't seem to have a lot of details on that, but it seemed interesting because one of the things I like making are homemade noodles. So I'm going to throw some of the witch's butter in the next time and see what happens. But wait, there's more. 
So I mentioned that these are very common in Asia. You can get all sorts of drinks and desserts and candies and all sorts of stuff uh, over there that has the Tremella fusiformis in it. And in particular, beauty prop, uh, products, topical beauty products designed as moisturizers. So this, again, goes back to it having some sort of demulcent character or compounds, things that help seal the membranes and re-moisturize the skin. But they've also found the process also works if you eat it. So you can apply the Trelliformis fusif uh, uh, Tremola fusiformis taste to your skin like a mask. But eating it also, it interferes with a chemical reaction that leads to breakdown and drying of the cellular membranes of the skin. So if you put it on the outside, it hydrates from the outside. If you consume it, it basically hydrates from the inside. And this is why it's really popular over there. I mean, all the drinks and desserts are promoted as good for the health. Also, uh, it has a long history of being used in Asia for lung health, again, by the consuming of it. And the mucus isn't going to travel in the blood to the ovoli or the lungs. So there's some other thing going on. Uh, at this point, it has not been elucidated by the medicinal chemists what compounds are in there uh, that seem to help the lungs, only that eating it does seem to help with breathing issues. So a lot of science needs to be done yet, but the preliminary results look very good. All right. Any questions on the witch's butter? All right, we're getting through this kind of fast. I was thinking there'd be more questions. Next up, polypores. And I, I particularly used this mushroom, this uh, boletus, as the introduction to polypores because I have not been able to figure out what this one is. Um, I have not actually used the boletus filter website to go through it but I've never found this in any other mushroom book, but it has a purple fuzzy cap, a kind of a lavender violet under uh, surface, and then a kind of a webbed purplish stem. And if anyone out there knows what purple, purple, purple boletus uh, is, let me know. Okay, cool. All right. So we're not going to talk about that one. Yeah, so oh, yeah. Jared McRae, I was going to say, Jared, Jared McRae is uh, really great with the identification of the species in okay. Texas. I can send you his info. Okay, yes, please. Yeah, because uh, I they drive me up a wall. There's so many of them out there and trying to figure out which are the good ones and which are the bad ones. It's I get a little impatient and I go, ah, I'll go find one I know, but... Anyway, they're all over again, the, uh, the playgrounds around my neighborhood. So I thought it was really interesting. So there's a bunch of them around here in spring. Okay, the Heracium, the Heracium enriate, I'm not gonna try and pronounce that, but the Coriolis and the Americanum. These are some more cold, wet weather, dead wood growing mushrooms. Um, side note, the you are allowed to harvest one gallon of mushrooms per day for personal use, not to sell, from the national forests here in Texas. So the Sam Houston National Forest, the Davy Crockett National Forest, the Angelina National Forest, and the Sabine National Forest. Um, at least the last time I checked. I check every few years just to make sure that it's still going and uh, checking last spring. Apparently it was still wood, so hopefully it's still going now. But one of my favorite things to do is once hunting season ends, uh, usually you know it ends the first weekend in January, the second weekend, uh, I and some buddies, we, we go up into the Sam Houston and we start looking for the lion's mane. Because if you've never eaten a lion's mane, which you should, 
they're very delicious. And once you see the medicinal properties, you're going to really want to. But sautéed in butter, they taste like lobster. So good. Like a nice uh, lion's mane bisque, like a lobster bisque or lion's mane lobster cakes or things like that. Now I'm hungry. Anyway, so <laughs> they're very easy to identify because they basically look like, uh, if you remember the snowball, the hostess snowball, uh, coconut snack cakes, kind of like white versions of them on trees or elongated, but they're basically just a, a big cluster of the teeth, the dangly tubes. So they technically are a polypore, they just, the pores are at the ends of the dangly tubes. But again, a cold weather, wet weather sort of mushroom. Winter time, especially in the Houston area, absolutely fantastic. This is one cut in half. It almost looks like a brain. And that makes a lot of sense because it has some amazing uh, brain, regenerative brain protecting powers. But if the 72 gram serving, you do get 25 calories, five carbs, some protein and assorted other stuff. Then some niacin, the uh, B5, foliate and choline, uh, good amounts of that. A little bit of iron, a little bit of phosphorus, a little bit of zinc, but definitely one you wanna eat. So most of the research is on the true lion's mane, which is the round one. Then there is also the uh, coral tooth mushroom, where it looks like a coral reef and just shorter tubes. And then the bear's head tooth mushroom, the uh, Heracium americanum, which again is instead of being a ball, is kind of spread out, but has longer tubes than the Coriolis, Coriolides one. Very distinctive. One thing they do not have is a smooth, solid uh, top. There is some mimics out there on, that grow on dead wood that have like a, a shelf bracket mushroom that has a smooth top and then the tubes dangling down from it. That's not going to be a heresium. So going back to it, um, and actually, the, the, all three of them have been tested for a lot of medicinal properties. So I found 311 scientific research papers uh, talking about the powers of the different heresicums. So the biggest one, and one that was found in all of them, was neuron growth. So these mushrooms, again, they're found in Asia. I'm, I'm not sure if they're found in Europe. I have to look into that but they're found in Asia and North America. And over in Asia, they were used to help maintain the brain. Going back into ancient, you know, basically to as far back as there was written uh, medicinal guides in Asia. The lion's mane was way up there for brain health because it increases the number of neural connections between the brain cells. So you have more brain cells connected to each other. And this helps with problem solving. It helps with memory. It helps with cognition in general. Awesome. Also helps with uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. As on both these, you have two neurons, you know, connecting brain cells. And then you get clusters of proteins kind of clumping up on that neuron, preventing the flow of of signals down that neuron. So by having more connections, you can kind of bypass that, that clump of proteins. <laughs> I really get into these talks. Okay, antidepressant. It's been shown to improve moods and help lift moods and make you feel less depressed. Anti-cancer, there are compounds in there that have been found uh, both in test tubes, but also actual studies in people to help fight cancers. So tastes like lobster, good for the brain, good for the body, good for the mood. Heck yeah, bring that one on. Whoops, 
So any questions about the Harasim or the lion's mane? It's a couple. So Benny yeah. asks, for all medicinal properties discussed in these mushrooms, uh, are they seen by long-term use or large dose, large doses or small doses? Like any, um, I'm sure there's okay. like a lot of varying. So actually most, uh, especially in the brain side, that's where the most of it done. It takes a while for the effect to occur because it takes a while for the neurons to start growing. So the dose, hold on one second. I can tell you how much it takes. Give me, give me one second. I should have this ready. So <laughs> the brain bill by Medicine Man Plant Co. So the dosage of my products were based on what it takes the average adult of 165 pounds to receive on a daily dose to get the effects we're trying to get. And with the lion's mane extract, this is where we did a hot water extract of the fruiting body of the lion's mane and then freeze dried it down to the actual materials. It's under 800 milligrams. It's 700 and 750 milligrams of material. Now, if you're eating it, that would fall oops, in there. Uh, that would probably fall within the, the 75 gra uh, grams, 72 grams of a single serving. But yeah, this is something if you're truly trying to get these results, you need small doses over time rather than one big dose and let it do its job. That has been one thing that has been found with you know, not just pharmaceutical medicines, but a lot of the plant-based stuff and mushroom-based stuff. Um, as far as mushroom-based stuff that you only need one fairly large dose to get the effects for, uh not legal yet so we'll just leave it at that okay <laughs> Any more questions on this one um yes. does eating the fruit destroy the medicinal compounds no so that's one of the nice things about it is even if you cook with it and all that the medicinal compounds are stable up to over 400 degrees wow so they can handle a lot of stuff that's one thing that's uh, a lot of people Plants aren't as fragile as we think, and mushrooms, sorry, mushrooms aren't as fragile as we think. Um, there are some compounds that get broken down, but cooking, most of these does not have a negative effect on their properties. Okay, so someone asked, um, have you heard a claim that lion's mane may reduce libido? No, I have not. I've heard that in soy and some other things that are estrogen stimulators. Um, and in that case, they are reducing the libido in men, uh, lesser effect on women. Okay. And then um, Eric asked, do you get the same benefits from eating as you do from a dual extract? Ah, uh, you, yeah. So the dual extract where you're using water and alcohol to extract the water soluble and the alcohol soluble compounds, if you're eating it, you're getting all that plus more. So in, in a perfect world, you would have this growing in a closet and taking some every day and eating it. The extracts are good. They're, they're very good, and especially they're convenient, they're shelf stable, they're easy, um, and they're proven that they have the powers. But the, you know, there's something you said about lobster. Yeah. Um, and so Kayla, she asks, um, you know, that you did cover like some of the cognitive, um, the neuron growth, but is there any specific studies on kind of neurological damage from strokes or um, MS and things? Yes. Like that? Yes, there are actually to help people regain use of their brain, damaged brain cells, because you're the brain is absolutely amazing. If you want to waste an afternoon learning about humans, read about people that have had large sections of their brains removed, especially as children, and how they really seem to be completely functioning and no issues from it. So 
the brain is considered to be a very elastic organ. And if you remove parts of it, give it time and training and the right stimuli, it can rewire itself and parts that didn't normally control speech or writing or things like that can step up and take over that. It's not a fast process. It's not take three pills and whoa, I can you know play the violin again. But there is definitely uh, work done. And one of the really exciting things is the uh, neuroprotective. So if you suffer a concussion, say you're in a car wreck or something like that, they found there are compounds in the heresium that they help reduce the brain swelling and basically self-destruction of brain cells that occur from a serious head trauma. So a lot of exciting things with that. I would love to see someday ambulances carrying, you know, little capsules or shots or something that they can pop into someone that they just pulled out of a wrecked car with, you know, of their head caved in uh, and reduce the long-term damage that way so lots of exciting stuff being done with this mushroom or these mushrooms any others all right turkey tail i'm sure most of you are familiar with paul stamets and his his love of turkey tail and i kind of go in waves on Paul Stamets. He he does some great research, but he's a great showman too. And I, I gotta say he he you know maybe sometimes he over promises and under delivers in the real world, but he at least he's looking and he's trying and he's bringing stuff to the attention of others that we should be aware of. Okay, so Turkey Tail, the Tramita is a versicolor. This is another dead wood sort of mushroom. The diameter of the fan one to three inches it's only going to be about an eighth of an inch thick so if what you're looking at looks like a fan shaped turkey tail but it's like a quarter inch thick it's not turkey tail it's one of the other things related to it velvety fuzzy on the top with very distinct bands of color and if you flip it over there will be very distinct pores underneath and these i find at least in the houston area all year round. So from a nutritional point of view, they actually have a lot of complex carbohydrates, which is very interesting. I really, really want to take turkey tail and mix it with the uh, giant puffball amylase and then hit some yeast in there and see what I get. But I haven't had a chance to do that yet. 15% protein. 48 units of vitamin D, not bad, 3.5% fat, and quite a bit of potassium. Traces of some important uh, minerals, including nice, well, iron, selenium, copper, and then the vitamin B35. Here's a good picture of the gills. It's a little tricky to get the pictures of gills, but they have very, very, very tiny, 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 tiny pores. Very, very small. But looking at the scientific papers, 1,020 scientific articles total. 62 of those were on cancer and oncology. Over 150 were on its antimicrobial and antiviral properties. And 79 were on antioxidants. And then the rest were just various other things. This is a mushroom that has undergone a lot of research and it stands up to a lot of the rigorous vigorous research testing poking prodding disbelief oh my god it worked sort of thing so on the cancer stuff um a number of the papers are in a test tube but there's also quite a few on actual real live human beings suffering cancer and all sorts of especially the tumor type cancers so like the 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 colon cancer lung cancer prostate cancer breast cancer uh, a lot of those it seems to interfere uh possibly by more than one mechanism they're still trying to figure out all the details and as i said earlier once they do 
the most likely process then will be to take those molecules, figure out how to make them from the ground up, rather than have a bunch of dead wood around and trying to grow the turkey tail on it. Because any of you involved in growing mushrooms, you know, just the sterilization process is very energy intensive. And so if you don't have to sterilize big chunks of wood, suddenly the process of making it becomes somewhat uh, less expensive. So something to think about there. Trying to help you understand the whole big picture. And again, going back to if you're trying to medicate the masses, you need mass produced medicine. But the herbs and the mushrooms, those are the, the medicines of the elite. All right. Any questions on the turkey tail? There are some mimics. The mimics have undergone some study, like the false turkey tail, where instead of pores on the underside, it's just smooth. Uh, what is it? Stericeum oleresta or something like that. And then there's also the gilled polypore where instead of polypores, it has the traditional gill-like shape. Neither of them are poisonous. And I will say as far as turkey tail, as far as eating, you don't eat it. It's like eating a piece of leather. But if you chop it up and boil it, it makes a wonderful mushroom broth that I like drinking just as a tea in the woods, but also it makes a great base for soups and stews, wherever you would have like a mushroom soup or add mushrooms to the, the product. So the boiled, chopped up boiled turkey tail mushrooms actually make a very, very good broth to use as a base for other foods. If you're trying to do it medicinally, you can freeze dry or dehydrate the turkey tails, grind them into a powder and consume the powder either in capsules or sprinkled on other food, mix in with some cream cheese, cottage cheese, things like that. Very good. Um, or you can do the double extraction. Uh, one of the people had mentioned where you soak it in alcohol for a while to extract the alcohol soluble components, and then you boil it in water to extract the water soluble and then combine the water and the alcohol to make uh, the double extraction, concoction, decoction sort of product. Very useful mushroom. I like the flavor. I like its medicinal properties. I like its attractiveness. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Beautiful food and medicine, a beautiful drink and medicine. This is a great world we live in. Okay, any questions on the turkey tail? Yeah, so uh, there's a question. Uh, can there be some negative side effects? Not that I have seen, not that I have seen reported. Uh, if there was going to be one negative side effect, it may be a slight thinning of the blood, which becomes a problem if you are about to undergo surgery where uh, you may bleed more than the doctor would like. So often they will ask you to stop herbal supplements in general, at least two weeks before any surgery. Uh, but a number of herbs and mushrooms have that effect. But as far as any others, nothing I have seen reported anywhere, uh, nothing I've personally experienced, nothing any of my friends, family that have been using it have experienced. Okay. All right. I don't see any other questions. Um... All righty. Then let's move on to the tinder or hoof mushroom, the Fomus fomitarius. Uh, in fact, I believe that's what uh, Sam the fungi has uh, in his profile picture there he's attacking. This is another deadwood mushroom. Uh, these things, they can get about 10 inches in diameter and six or more inches in height because they are a multi-year growing mushroom. So they put out you know, levels and layers. This is more of a summertime mushroom. It likes the heat, it likes some of the summertime rains. That's when it's mainly going to be growing. And then it goes more dormant during the winter months. What is in it? 
So looking through the papers, I couldn't really find any breakdown of actual nutritional, this many vitamins, this many carbohydrates, that sort of thing. But there were a lot of papers mentioning uh, beta-glucans, which is a very common uh, mushroom molecule, the melanin, lignans, humic acid, and chitin. So the main claim to fame, in my mind, is the tinder slash hoof mushroom was one of the two mushrooms found with Utsi the Iceman. Uh, Utsi the Iceman was a 5,000-year-old, uh, basically perfectly preserved human found up in the Alps. He had been killed and more or less died and was left there and just got covered up by the snow and the ice. And then as things started melting, it's been a while now. Has it been 30 years? Might have been 30 years. Um, he was exposed. At first, they thought he was a murder victim, and he was, but it was a murder 5,000 years ago. But the Utsi, the Iceman, is one of our best examples of the technology, clothing, food, and really everything we have from the European uh, humans 5,000 years ago. The use uh, that they believe Utsi was using it for is both as a fire starter and fire transporter, but also antimicrobial properties. So the special thing about the tinder mushroom, why it's called the tinder mushroom, is if you just take it, cut it into slices, let it dry, and then hit it with a spark like from a flint and steel. And that's what's going on here. Again, I hope you can see my cursor, but we have the steel, we have a piece of flint, and this glowing red dot is where a spark from my flint and steel hit the mushroom and it caught and you blow on it and you can get a big ember. And then you can use that ember to start an actual big fire. Those of you who know primitive skills, you can't just take flint and steel and strike it against some like shredded tree bark like cedar or something like that that won't catch you need some sort of tinder that will hold and maintain and grow the ember in modern days that would be char cloth but back then it was this particular mushroom which is found all over the world this is one of the the key things that allowed us to easily build a fire by just once we created a spark or if you just let it sit there, that ember will just sit there and smolder. So in the morning, you would take a little bit of, you know, from the fire, you would start your, your tinder hoof mushroom, your, your tinder slash hoof mushroom, get it glowing, and it would just smolder and you would have an ember all day long until you got to the campsite in the afternoon, late afternoon, and want to build a new fire. Then you take your, your tinder mushroom, put some smaller tinder around it, blow on it, and you have fire. That saves a lot of calories. Hmm. But also, the mushroom has been found to have all sorts of really potent antimicrobial properties. And so they believe he was also using it to prevent infection in wounds. More recently, anti-cancer properties, powerful antioxidants, uh, anti-diabetic so again helping with the type 2 uh, either the insulin resistance or blood sugar control antiviral properties and what they call oligocellulitic for animal feeds so there are enzymes in the tinder mushroom that help break down plants that animals wouldn't normally be able to eat as food and render it into something they can digest so this has a lot of potential for, especially like now when all this corn is being used to make ethanol and other things, and it's not being used for animal feed, it allows other things, other plant matter to be broken down and used as food instead of say corn. So kind of neat. Imagine, you know, mixing it with some sawdust and now the animal can eat the sawdust and get nutrients from the sawdust. Pretty cool. But wait, there's more. So nerve growth factor. So not just in the brain, but also helping 
rebuild damaged nerves. There's been some really interesting studies on that, that uh, there's something in it that stimulates the growth of, of nerves. Pretty awesome. The melatonin, it helps trigger the production of melatonin and to the point where it's being considered as a natural sunblock where you you basically take some tender mushroom capsules you darken you do need some sunlight but then you protect yourself from the sunlight the way we evolved to protect ourselves from the sunlight by darkening our skin and the anti-asthmatic anti-arthritic pretty nice anti-inflammatory and then of course the sunblock like i said so very, very interesting mushroom with all sorts of really interesting research going on. And it's growing in all the dead trees around us. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right. I see it's 825. Um, are there any questions on the tinder mushrooms? I don't see any. Okay. So oh. next we do have guild. Um, Maybe we can just zip through them really quick. So of the different guild mushrooms, especially out right now, the elm oyster is one I really like. This is a one that grows on damaged wood. I find it more often on trees that are still alive, but they're definitely damaged and there are dead sections on them. Six inch diameter cap. The gills run down the cap some, but not very far. So, it, so we see barely decurrent gills. Uh, they seem to really like box elder trees in particular. They think elm oyster, they would go for elm trees and they go for elm trees, but their favorite seems to be the box elder. And this is a fall and winter sort of plant. Uh, as far as what's in it, a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of protein. I love this one. To me, cooked up, this one tastes kind of like a mixture of pot roast and walnuts. And it's very easy to identify. This is one you want to learn to identify, especially because when it appears, usually you get several of them together. So, food. Uh, as far as medicinal properties, antioxidant, uh, anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor, some good stuff here. Very good stuff here. But also there's this decolorization of different dyes. And people go, okay, decoloring dyes. What's the purpose of that? That's for waste treatment. So if you can decolorize azo and heterocycles dyes, you can also break down a lot of other industrial compounds. So there's some really interesting research using these as water treatment compounds to help break down stuff to reclean our water. Fringe sawgill. These are all over Houston. I love seeing these. So Lenta, uh, Lentinus crintius. <laughs> I'm screwing that up. Deadwood, two inch diameter, fuzzy tops, low decurrent gills. You'll see that in the next picture. And this is a summertime hot weather mushroom. Now these are related to the shiitake. And so I actually, uh, there wasn't much on the fringe, uh, fringe sawgill as far as nutritional value. So I did look at the shiitake carbohydrates, assorted minerals, a whole bunch of the different B vitamins. So some good stuff there. As far as medicinal uses, antimicrobial and uh, also some anti-cancer properties. They are another one. They are used to, uh, they are lithium bioaccumulators. So if you grow them on wood that you soak some lithium in lithium salts they will absorb that lithium and they're looking at using it as a new delivery method for lithium compounds for those uh that have the the mental issues that involve taking lithium like the bipolar type stuff so it's a a new way of introducing more bioavailable lithium into the human body which is pretty cool um, there's also some really interesting antimicrobial properties in it that are being used to see if they can be used as food preservatives. 
So right now we have a lot of synthetic food preservatives, um, but this would be a natural one. So kind of cool there. Love preserving food. Last one, the American Titan. Macrocybe Titans. Uh, again, my neighborhood seems to be blessed with these. So these are big, big mushrooms. They grow out of the grass. The cap can be 12 inches or more in diameter. The uh, gills are very close together, come right up to the stem. The cap starts rounded, but it inverts as it gets older. And if you look at the, the, the stem of the mushroom, bulbous bottom and scaly upright scales along the surface. So very distinctive thing. So as far as medicinal uses of this, the fucogalactans, so a type of sugar with shrubbery is the easiest way to think of that, has been found to inhibit the uh, migration of, of skin cancer cells. So skin cancer by itself is usually very easily to take care of. You cut it out, you freeze it, you do something like that. But if you leave it unattended, it starts to migrate and go other places. There's compounds in the American Titan that interfere with that. Um, but uh, also some other types of tumor growth. So the actin uh, skeleton, that is, cells actually do have a skeleton. There's something that holds human, you know, animal, mammal, every membrane-based cell in shape, and that is the actin. It's like fibers of protein. And there's compounds in the American Titan that basically break the bones of cancer cells. And so they lose shape. And when they lose shape, they can't do what they're trying to do. And so it's a way of, of painfully, hopefully, killing the cancer. More work needs to be done, but it's a whole new way of treating cancer. All right, let me jump uh, quickly. So the mushroom books I really like. If you are, you know, you guys probably already know these. You probably all have these, but the 100 Edible Mushrooms by Michael Coe. Uh, if you're strictly inter interested in edible mushrooms, that would be the one mushroom book to get. Because if it's not in there, it's not going to be edible. And then Mushrooms of the Southeast is really good. And of course, the classic by uh, Metzler and Metzler, the Texas Mushrooms. Yeah. And of course, Medicine Man Planko, ancient plants scientifically supported for modern issues. So at this point, we have uh, any questions? We're a little over, but if people don't mind, I can stick around for a little bit. Yeah, um, there was a question about the taste of Titans. Are they bitter? Somewhat. They're not the best tasting mushroom out there. Um, slight, not some, I would say acrid more than bitter. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're, 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 it's normally you want other stuff in there with it. Okay. Um, and then Jason asks about the um, the agaricus, like, you know, the portabellas, the button mushrooms, the criminis. Do those have any medicinal qualities? So I haven't looked into that because they're not wild. Mm -hmm. I, I have some vague memories of yes, but I could not tell you what they are. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? And I also threw in a link to the newest uh, field guide that covers Texas mushrooms. Mm. Uh, it was um, David Lewis, who's in uh, the Houston area. Um, oh, okay, yeah. Over Big th Thicket, him and um, the Best Sets, they wrote that, the latest one. Excellent, yeah, I need and to so get that one now. Cool. Yeah, it's, on a, it's a UT Press. On okay. UT Press. Um, but that's the one we like to refer people, because our, our state mushroom is not even in the Texas Mushroom Field Guide, the old one. <laughs> I've seen a couple of those. They're cool, too. Yeah. In Houston area? Or in no, more area? more up and about. Yeah. 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 They're they're starting to pop off. So, yeah. Check out Corey Actress Gaster. 
or state mushroom. It grows on dead cedar elm stumps and older stumps. So once they start to kind of look like they've been burned or like the mycelium or the fungus like turns a stump kind of a black color. Yeah. That's when you start to see them pop up. Found uh, here in Japan, which is fascinating. Very fascinating. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other. What does the tender hoof taste like? Uh, mushroomy. Uh, no. I would say one of the more, uh, Third, maybe? the, so like the one octanol is responsible for the flavor of say the white button mushrooms, you know, the, a lot of the standard mushrooms that we eat is that mushroomy smell. Uh, if you make a tea from the tinder mushroom, it kind of has a similar odor flavor to it that way. Nice. All right. Well, if there isn't any other questions, um, thank you so much, uh, Mark, for sharing your knowledge with us. There was a lot of good information out there. And if you if you don't have plans Thursday evening and want to get more mush with us, then we have another program getting into even more mushrooms around the world and ethnomycology and the use medicinal and nutritional use so yeah we're feeling feeling like consuming mushrooms this week in all ways <laughs> oh they're good um, things to eat thank you so much and uh we hope to see you in person next time when you're uh, have more time to spend up here <laughs> cool and um yeah i'm excited that you're doing some stuff with beerberg they're a lot of fun we mm -hmm. did a walk with them this past year talking about right. it yeah. one day Cool. Uh, and if y'all haven't been out there, check them out. They're really great doing lots of really fun things with yeasts and fungus and plants and herbs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks again, everyone, for coming out and have a good rest of the week. Thank you. Uh. Thanks very much. You're welcome. <laughs>